We are going to be, actually, you know what, I made a mistake there. We're going to be looking at a sermon series starting this week. Yeah, that's about right. On the Feast of the Lord. Um, we're going to go a little bit of introduction and we're going to the Spring Feasts this weekend. Next weekend, we're going to be looking at the Fall Feasts. Uh, and I'm hoping that the uh, Lord helping me that I can present. And we're going to look at in the spring feasts, we can see Jesus fulfilled each and every one of the spring feasts that we're going to be talking about this morning. The fall feasts, in the same way that we see Jesus in the spring feasts, in the fall feasts, there are three. We're going to be looking at those and seeing that when Jesus' return comes, he's going to be fulfilling those, which are still future. They're, they're not done yet. So let's look here. We've got the seven feasts of the Lord we're going to be looking at. Now if we look over here, in the spring, we've got the Passover, we've got unleavened bread, first fruits, and the Feast of Pentecost. So all those are this in the spring. Then we have a, a time of... Uh, well, uh, you want to call it a, a break between both if we're looking at it uh, just year by year where the harvest is, is coming in, people are, are working, uh, farmers, and then we have the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. Now, I, I hope I can present this to you to understand that as Jesus fulfilled the Passover with His body, on the cross uh, and we're going to go through these other ones so we're going to be able to see that Jesus is going to fulfill through the trumpets the day of atonement and tabernacles at his return so this is kind of a challenge for us to take a look at and I'm hoping that uh, God will help us to understand these issues so Moses and the children of Israel they left Israel I mean they left Egypt I'm sorry the I don't know if we would call it in the morning after the Passover, because we don't know exactly what time Moses left. I know in Hollywood, on Charlton Heston, they left in the morning. Uh, this picture kind of has them leaving after. Now, we know that Pharaoh told Moses, I want you to get out now. He didn't say, okay, here's six or eight hours. He was very much uh, wanting them to leave immediately. So if you take that from the Hebrew understanding of it, you leave now. So... They may have left early in the morning. They may have left still while it was night. We don't know. But we do know that they, they were to leave immediately as soon as they could. So they did. Uh, we know also that only those who were not in a house or a building that had the blood on the lintel and the doorposts, which would mean all those. And I think there were some Egyptians who maybe did that. I'm not saying many, but for those who didn't, the, their firstborn died. And if we read in the scripture, it says there was not a home where there wasn't death in there. So we see that that happened and that they left. That was the first beginning of the feasts, which was the feast of Passover, uh, if you want to call it that. Although nowadays they view the feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread as one, even though they're two different events. So they arrived at Mount Sinai where they were to meet with God personally. God wanted to introduce himself to them. They saw all these ten plagues fall upon Egypt. They saw all these things. But now God was going to talk to them. That's what he wanted. He, wa he didn't want them to go straight over into Canaan. He wanted to introduce and get to know who their God was. So this is what we're actually looking at. Uh, and they didn't know God or his name. Remember what Moses said to God? What is your name? Because they're going to ask, what is his name? So they didn't even know him. In fact, I would venture to say most of the children of Israel did not know God by the time of Moses coming upon the scene. They didn't know who he was. Uh, so this was going to be a time of, of, of interaction between God and his people. So they were introduced to God in a covenant relationship. He says, if you will, that's a covenant. If you will, then God says, then I will. So that's covenant language. 
So he was coming to them saying, if you will keep my law, if you will do these things, I will be your God. So there was an if and understanding. So we look at the Ten Commandments, and we need to realize when we look at the Ten Commandments, we need to insert based on love. Because Jesus comes along and he says, if you love me, what does he say? Keep my commandments. So we need to realize that all the commandments that were brought out, if we love God, we keep the first four. If we love our fellow neighbor, we keep the ten, I'm the last six. So we need to realize they're based on love. How can you keep a commandment out of duty and not out of a sense of an emotional attachment between one and another? They're also given at that time when they were there various civil laws and there were appointed times and seasons of holy worship in which they were to come together. Now we're going to go into Leviticus and we're going to do some reading here this morning. So let's go to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. I don't know if you've got a bulletin, but I've got some sermon notes out there for you. Leviticus 23. And we're, gonna, we're not going to read the whole book per se, I mean the whole chapter per se in Leviticus 23. We're going to take certain scriptures from this. So let's go with Leviticus 23. We're going to start with verses 1 to 3. These are all going to be descriptions of the feasts that we're looking at. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord. Now we need to understand that. This does not say the feasts of the Jews. Right? Feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Now the first one we come out with again. Six days shall your work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So we need to just understand in verse 2, as he's talking about the feasts, they're the feasts of the Lord. We also take into the Sabbath. This is the Sabbath of the Lord. It's not the Sabbath of the Jew. So when people tell you that's a Jewish Sabbath, there is no such thing. Because God's not a Jew. So if they come from God, and if we're looking at the feasts, we're going to realize they come. They're not the Jewish feasts. They were what God gave to the Jewish people, and not only to the Jewish people, but they're also for the Gentiles. We'll take a look at that. So these are holy times specifically set aside for God with His people. God is a jealous God. Amen. When He talks about the Sabbath, He says, this is my time with you. You've got six days you need to work. I understand to do all these things. But He said, the seventh day is my time with you. Amen. So we understand He wants that time more than we do. Just like the Sabbath, the Hebrews commanded to keep away uh, to come away from their daily labors so they could come in a time of celebration. We don't look at the Sabbath, oh, you mean you go to church on the Sabbath? What a, what a somber time. No, it isn't. It is a time of celebration. We get together as the family of God. We celebrate God. We understand and hear what God has to say to us. So they were to come. This was the reason for it. Why? Because God asked us to come. Amen. It wasn't we decided. It's God said, I want time with you. So, oh, I'm sorry, we need to go back. I was getting ahead of myself there. Let's go to the second set, verses 4 to 7, so you understand. The Sabbath is a holy time set apart by God. We can't go and say, well, now we're going to change it. Amen. So, verses 4 to 7. These are the feasts, look what it says, of the Lord. This is the second time in three verses where Moses is saying, these are the feasts of the Lord. Even holy convocations which you shall proclaim in their seasons. Now that word season has a it's a it's a time period. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. You see the Lord's Passover? It doesn't say Jewish Passover. The Lord was going to pass over. And on the fifteenth day of the same day is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Let's see how far we're supposed to end. Verse 7. And in the first day you shall have an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Now let's skip on down to verses 15 to 17. Verse 15. And you shall count unto you from the mouth. So now first of all, let's, let's back up for a second. We've got the feast of Passover that was talked about. The feast of unleavened bread. 
And in fact, they coincide with each other. The, the evening before was the Passover, and starting the, that night and the next day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that went for seven days. Now the third one is verse 15. And you shall count unto you on the morrow after the Sabbath from the day after you've brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You know I've made a mistake here. First of all, let me go back here. I'm not a professional, so you have to forgive me for that. We have the feast, we have the Passover, then the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, let, let me get this straight for you to understand. On, day, on the evening was the Passover. The next day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They started eating unleavened bread for seven days. The third day, which is on the second day of unleavened bread, on that day, they had the Feast of First Fruits. So we need to understand all three of these first feasts come within days of each other. The first day is the Passover. The second day is the first day of unleavened bread. So let's get that right. And then the third day is the first day of feast of, of, of first fruits. And what would happen is people would go out into their fields and they'd cut and take a scythe and cut off a bunch of grain, sheaf, and, and uh, take that and take it into the priest. And this was to say, okay, here's my first fruits I'm giving to God. So if we can go back just for a second, let's just go back here. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll skip ahead here. But there we go. Okay, so let's look at it. These first three feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, are very much intertwined with each other. Now, as I said, the first fruits is the third day. And you know why we'll get this. Let, let me just give a little part on that now. Passover the lamb. Second day is unleavened bread where they didn't eat unleavened bread for a week. And the third one, first fruits, is you were bringing in the first fruits of your barley harvest in. So all three of these are within days of each other. And we're going to find out as Jesus fulfilled these, how that worked out very well. So let's go back here. I'm sorry. Okay, so let's go now. Now we can go to 15 to 17. You'll have to forgive me for that. So now we're talking about the Feast of Pentecost. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. See, so we get that idea. Passover, unleavened bread, but the third day starts the Feast of Unleavened, I mean, of first fruits. He says, after that, you shall count seven Sabbath shall be complete. So you're counting 49 days, and on the 50th day, even on the morrow, after the Sabbath, shall you number 50 days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And you shall bring out your out of your habitation two wave loaves of tenth, two tenth deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be of bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Oh, I'm really mixing myself. I'm sorry about that. But anyways, so that's what happened. This was supposed to be a, the, the first fruits, and then 50 days after, which is, let's go 23 to 28. I'm kind of, 23 to 20. And Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say, In the seventh month, no, 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 I'm sorry. That was what I just said was, I'm sorry. I'm confusing, especially our folks at home. I'm sorry about that. That was the Feast of Pentecost, what I just told you about, the feast that was 50 days after. The three before that were the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the First Roots. And then 50 days after was the Pentecost. And then in the fall, verses 23 to 28, and I'm sorry for making you up, mixing you up on that. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and this is verse 24 now, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. That's why we call it the Feast of Trumpets, a holy convocation. And you shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. This is after the Feast of Trumpets. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls, which means they had to fast, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And you shall do no work in that day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. Now, so that is 
Day of Atonement and the Feast of Trumpets. Now we're going to go to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is uh, verses 33 to 36. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. It would be like our thanksgiving. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work therein. So now, I've kind of stumbled a little bit. Hopefully now we can get this going here. All right. So as we understood, these are holy times specifically set by God. Just like the Sabbath, these are holy unto the Lord. Let's go to the next one. Now let's go to Exodus 12, verse 7. And I'm sorry I kind of mixed that up there with you. Exodus 12, verse 7. We're going to go into the Passover. You were supposed to take a lamb from the 10th day to the 14th day. And then you were to take it and to kill it in the evening. Well, let's read, let me read verse 6. And you shall keep it unto the 14th day of the, seven, of the same month, and the holy assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And let's go to verse 17. No, oh boy. No, let, let, me, let me read. Let me continue reading verse 7. And you shall take of the blood and strike it upon the two door posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So this was the Passover. That's what we were supposed to do. The evening before... You were to have the Passover. Now let's go to verse 17. And right after that, which is the next day, and you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. So we see that they are called feasts of the Lord. So just as the Sabbath is not the Jewish Sabbath, so these feasts are appointed by the Lord to all that wanted fellowship with him. We need to understand that there was a mixed multitude that came with Moses and the children of Israel out. So when they came to peace the, keep the Passover, there were mixed multitude that also did this. And the reason I say this is because these same people left with Moses and Aaron and with the children of Israel. So they left. So... We need to understand, let's just take a couple of verses out of Exodus 12. Let me just go with verse 19. We're going to see it wasn't only the Hebrews that were involved in this. Let's go to Exodus 12, verse 19. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For, what, for whosoever eats that which is leaven, even that soul shall be cut off of the congregation of Israel. Whether he be a stranger, that's a Gentile, or born in the land. Let's go one more verse. Let's go with verse 42. Same chapter. Let's go verse 42. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. And then verse 48. Sorry. And when a stranger shall sojourn with you and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and let them come near and keep it and he shall be as one that is born in the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof so they the males did have to be circumcised but god expected them if they were dwelling with israel that they were to keep these laws and if they didn't they were to be cut off so it wasn't just the jew only why because in verse 49 we have and one law shall be to him that is home born and unto the stranger that sojourns among you was one law. So they, they, it was whether you were Gentile or a Jew, you were keeping the Passover. You were keeping these feasts if you dwelt among the children of Israel. So my point that I wanted to get out here, this wasn't just a Jewish feast. There are Gentiles involved in this too. Now we're going to start, because I kind of mix things up, and I'm sorry. We're going to start here with the Passover. Let's go back to Exodus 12, verses 3 to 6. I read a little bit of that earlier. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, 
a male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. This is the Passover. Let's go to Leviticus 17.11. And we're going to understand why this was. Leviticus 17 and verse 11. Why? Why was there blood to be shed? We find out why then God is telling Moses. So Leviticus 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Uh, and it makes me think immediately, well, is that maybe why Cain was, his offering was not accepted by God because he brought an offering of grains and whatever he was uh, working with at that time uh, as, a, as a farmer. But here it says that it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. So you cannot go and say, well, you know, I'm going to come to God through some way, some other way. I'm going to come through maybe uh, the Hindu way or, or the Buddhist way. This tells me Jesus gave his blood to open the door for us to have a relationship with God. There had to be shedding of blood. So we have to realize that's what it was for. The shedding blood lamb at the first Passover revealed to the people a price was going to be paid and, and, you know, you, you take a look at your little kids and if they have a nice little lamb, in four days they will get used to that lamb and like it. You know, they got a new buddy around the house and then they realize we have to kill that lamb. Why was that done? To help us realize a payment for our sin had to be paid for. And it's those poor lambs that had to pay for that. So... Let's go to the New Testament. What I'm hopefully going to do is reveal in the Old Testament what was brought forward and how Jesus uh, fulfilled that. So let's go to John 1, the Gospel of John 1, verse 29. And we're going to see that Jesus came to fulfill and that we need to understand that every lamb that was sacrificed back in those days was a type pointing to someone. So John 1, 29. The next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, what? The Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. So now we look back and we say, Aha, I get it. When John the Baptist said that to the disciples that were there, if it was Peter and Andrew, I mean James and Andrew, whoever else was there, they would immediately understand they're talking about the Lamb and that when John the Baptist talks about the Lamb of God, Aha, the Lamb of God. They're putting that together with the Passover. Now let's go to Revelation 13, verse 8. Revelation 13 and verse 8. And we also see this is way after, this is in the 90s AD. Revelation 13, verse 8. <clears throat> and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So we see that every lamb that was offered after Adam and Eve's sin was a type that tells us about Jesus Christ. He was the lamb of God. So Jesus was the Passover lamb. He sacrificed his blood for our sins that we might be clean. We might be healed from all of the things that sin had done to our lives. And although his disciples didn't understand that Jesus was, was going to pay with his life. Remember he talked to Peter? He says, who do men say that I the son of man am? Remember? He asked the disciples. And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus talked about how he's going to have to give up his life. And what did Peter say? Not so, Lord. We don't want you to do that. They didn't understand that he had to pay. And the only way that could be paid was not with the lambs anymore. It was with Jesus himself. They were types to lead us to the Messiah. So we understand the Passover, Jesus Christ fulfillment. Amen. Now let's go to the second, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let's go back to Exodus 12, verse 17, where I was a moment ago. And I'm sorry, I kind of skipped. I mean, I kind of goofed up on one of the slides. That's why it kind of appeared where it did. Exodus 12 and verse 17. Now we have the Passover, that's the evening. The next day, 
we have this taking place. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. This was one of the first reasons they are observing this. Why? God was bringing them out of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Now, so we've got the bread reminds them of the release from bondage. Leaven was a spiritual lesson concerning sin. He was trying to teach, God was the people, that we are not to have leaven in our lives as sin. Remember, we read in the New Testament, if, we, if I can jump ahead a little bit there, it says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul was talking about that. That was talking about the reference to sin. And they were to take this unleavened bread to realize we need to live a sinless life. Before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Hebrew people were to clean their houses of any leaven. What was that to do? That was to teach them they were to clean what? Their lives. Amen. We need to have clean hearts. And, and uh, you know what they did? I mean, this is interesting. I was doing some research on this. There are people who purposely will grind up, not to powder, but grind up breadcrumbs and put them all over the house. And then they go and grab a broom before coming of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and they will purposely clean out the, the, all the leaven they had to have out of the house. They're, this was a type of understanding. They had to clean their lives. So they purposely did this. A, a, a physical issue to help them realize what the spiritual was, which was to clean out all of the sin out of their lives. So that's what they were supposed to do. Now let's go, how did Jesus fulfill the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Let's go to Matthew 26, 26. Matthew 26 and verse 26. Now they knew what unleavened bread was. This is what they were having at the Passover. And as they were eating, Matthew 26, verse 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, which was the unleavened bread, and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is what? My body. Every time we have the Lord's Supper service, we recognize that the unleavened bread represents Jesus' body. When he was coming and he said, take, eat, this is my body, can you imagine the disciples saying, what are you asking me to do? You tell me this is your body, how can I go ahead and do that? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. But this is what Jesus says. I am, we need to understand that unleavened bread was to represent Jesus. And remember, Jesus lived a sinless life. He was the unleavened bread. Remember how he talked about in John? He told the disciples, not the disciples, well, the disciples and other people that are there, unless you eat this flesh and drink this blood, you have no life in you. If I can just paraphrase, he was talking about his body. Unless you come, and we're finding out later on, that the body was to be unleavened bread that were taken on the Lord's on the Lord's supper service. First Corinthians five verse seven. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are what unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrifice for us. So now he's not only talking about the Passover; he's referring to the unleavened bread which Jesus Christ was. So realize that when Jesus came, he fulfilled that. We eat unleavened bread at the Lord's Supper to remind us of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice of his sinless body. They understood when they were to sweep out this unleavened, it was to remind them they're sweeping sin out of their lives. So when we come with Jesus, he's talking about him being the unleavened bread. And we understand that from now on, his sinless body. <clears throat> Now let's go to the first fruits. Now hopefully I'll be able to get that right on this one here. The first fruits is the beginning of the barley harvest was held on the second day of unleavened bread. Let's go to, back to Leviticus 23, verses 10 and 11. We're going back and forth in the Old and New Testament. Leviticus 23, verses 10 and 11. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I have given unto you, and shall reap the harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. God got the first, not the last. 
So what they did, usually when, a, uh, when they were going in their farm yards and doing, they would usually get uh, their kids or someone who was not going to be working real hard in the, in the field. Here, cut the sheaf off. You take it to the priest. So they had to go. Well, the others were still working in the field. But as soon as they cut that with a scythe or whatever they used to cut it, they, they tied it together and away it went. Away it went to wherever the, the temple was or the tabernacle at that time. And you shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. So before you did anything else, that was cut. That was the first fruits. It was on its way to the priest. And why? Because it was a blessing to take it to the priest and the priest was going to bless you for what you were bringing. So the first day, let's get this right. Now, the first day on the evening was the Passover. The second day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The third day was the first day of the Feast of First Fruits. I hope we can understand that. All these were simultaneous together. Now we're going to understand why all of these three were together. Let's go. Jesus arose at the end of the third day. The first fruits. You see how that makes sense? The first day, he's the Passover. The second day, he's the unleavened bread. He went into the grave sinless. Amen. The third day, when we believe Jesus rose, guess what? He's the first fruits. Now you put all the feasts together and thought, does this make sense? I never thought of that before. But it now it does. It makes sense because he rose being the first among the dead. Let's go and find that. 1 Corinthians 15. And they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I learned something new. I did not know that. I thought that the Feast of First Roots was a little bit later on, but it's not. It's in right and coordination. So 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and 23. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and 23. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. You see how we get? As soon as Paul says first fruits, they understand, aha, you're talking about the feast. And they put together, Jesus is the first fruits. See, in our Gentile way and the way we are in Western culture, we wouldn't have put that together as a Jewish person. Said, okay, there you go. There's first fruits. I see what you're saying. So Jesus fulfilled the first fruits. Let's go to verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Do you know that we are all a type of first fruits? When Jesus comes again, we are also going to be again like that first fruit. Because why? Jesus had a resurrection body. Have we gotten it yet? No. So in a sense, it hasn't been fulfilled for us yet because it is afterward they that are Christ that is coming. So Jesus is the first fruits and we come later on. Amen. Let's go to James 1.18. James 1 verse 18. James 1 and verse 18. Of his own will begat he us. This is God, not ourselves. With the word of truth, that we should be a kind of what? First fruits of his creatures. So you see what's going on? We are first fruits. And uh, that's amazing. Jesus, the first one resurrected from the dead unto eternal life. Well, people can come and say, what about Lazarus and other people that were brought uh, back to life? They were not resurrected. They died later on. Jesus, when he was resurrected, he was not subject to death anymore. He was alive forevermore. We also received the promise, and it's on our hearts and our lives. We are first fruits too. So when Jesus comes again, we receive the body that he has. All right? Now we're going to go to the next one, which is going to be the Feast of Pentecost. Let's go to Leviticus 23. Verses 15 to 17. You read that once, but we're going to read it again. And you shall count unto you from the morrow. Now this is after the Passover, after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall you number fifty days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. 
and you shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves. You know, this is the only place where it says two wave loaves. You know why that is? It's going to be interesting to find out. You shall bring out your habitation two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baking with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. The Feast of Pentecost was 50 days after the Passover. Whenever that happened, you counted 50 days. This was the beginning of the wheat harvest. All right? And also the day traditionally when the law was given by Moses to God on Mount Sinai. So this is, if you ask a Jewish person what does Pentecost mean, they'll tell you right away, well, oh, here we go, we've got this. But I want you to take a look at something. Hopefully we can get to that. Let's go to Acts 2, verses 5 to 10. And I want you to see something here uh, that I hadn't seen before either. Acts 2, verses 5 to 10. Because I always viewed the day of Pentecost was a Jewish uh, incident, a Jewish uh, event that happened. Acts 2, verses 5 to 10. And I want you to look at something here. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. That's what I thought this was. I thought Pentecost was just a Jewish issue. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how do we hear every man in his own language wherein we were born, Parthians, Medes, Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya unto Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. I always thought, mistakenly so, that when that day of Pentecost came, it was just the Jews. But it's not. Because we read in verse 10, strangers of Rome referred to Gentiles, Jews, and proselytes. What's a proselyte? A person who uh, started keeping the law, who started worship. So it wasn't only. So you know what? That's where you get the two different loaves they were to bring out. You know why? One was Jewish, and one was to represent the Gentiles. And I didn't see that before. And that's the only place that is in there where it talks about two loaves. And I believe one was to represent the Jewish people and one was to represent the Gentiles. So there were proselytes. Gentile believers were there. And I always thought this was a Jewish event, but it's not. The church began in Pentecost with the empowerment of the people and the Holy Spirit. And I believe there were Gentiles saved on that day. Why? Because there were proselytes and strangers there. The importance for us to recognize here is that Jesus, through his coming to earth, fulfilled all of the spring feasts. We see in Passover, Jesus gave his life as the Lamb of God. The second one, he is the unleavened bread. Remember, he says, the take, eat, this is my body. This do in remembrance of me. It was he who was the unleavened bread. And then the next one, he was the first fruits from among the dead, the resurrection. And then he is also bringing about Pentecost, where he said, do you remember in Acts 2? And also was in Levit uh, uh, Luke, the 24th chapter, do not leave Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Who was giving him that power of the people? Jesus. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then we read also in Joel the promise of that that was going to come. So these all these spring feasts were fulfilled because of Jesus' coming. In our next message, we'll look at Jesus' return and how he will fulfill the fall feast with that return. So we see through each of these holy days that God set the plan. When these feast days were given, why? Because God knew what Jesus was going to be doing. This was their plan. Why? We take back to Jesus and Jesus said, what? The lamb from the foundation of the world that was slain. Even before Adam and Eve sinned, God knew what was going to happen. So he set out these feasts to proclaim Jesus' coming. 
in the fall, we're going to see the plan of Jesus return, the second advent. So we see that these holies were a sign of the coming of the Savior, the Passover, the Lamb represented the coming of the Messiah, unleavened bread, Jesus, our sinless Savior, first fruits, Jesus, the first of the resurrected, never to die again, and for Pentecost, Jesus brings life to the new church. We call that the birthday of the church. When? When did that happen? On Pentecost. And what happened? It was Jews and Gentiles who were being incorporated into the church. And if you check Peter, uh, Paul's writings, he never refers to two churches, only one. Only one body. And that was Jew and Gentile. Why? Because God brought them both in through Jesus Christ. There was no Jewish and Gentile church. There was just one church. And if we understand that, that Jesus did all of these things, we can see God's plan. And if we, Lord helping me, I won't be as, as a little bit muffled up like I was on the other one. We're going to see the second coming of Jesus also has God's plan behind it. It's not just, okay, Jesus, go ahead. There's a plan. And we're going to find that out, Lord willing. So... Father in heaven, we are thankful that you had a plan right from the very beginning. You were not caught off guard when Adam and Eve fell. You knew that was going to happen. You knew what was going to have to take place to bring us back to you. And you had that plan all along, God. And I'm thankful for that. You were going to save us through Jesus' work on the cross, through Jesus becoming our life by giving us his uh, body as the unleavened bread that he was the first fruits that we realize we are also a type of first fruits and that on the day of Pentecost you poured out your spirit upon us that we can be empowered to be your children we thank you for these issues Lord that uh, we can understand and Lord we just pray in the name of Jesus as we come to the fall feast you'll help us have a good understanding about that too as well and we ask in Jesus name Amen